Okay, so we're going through the last two chapters of Hebrews. In the last two chapters of Hebrews, there's a lot more practical um, wisdom and practical teaching in there. So hopefully this is a good reminder uh, for some of you, or for all of you, sorry, not some of you, for all of you, uh, what we ought to be doing and some things that we ought to be doing as Christians. <clears throat> so let's go to Hebrews 12. So remember last week, Hebrews 11 was the hall of faith. That's what they call Hebrews 11. And we talked about and we saw different examples in the Old Testament going through chronologically people that had endured some hard things. And it was because of their faith they were able to go through, through those things. And through, through those things, they also saw things and understood things that they would not otherwise have understood or saw had they not the faith. So then we get on to Hebrews 12, where now he's applying those examples that we read in Hebrews 11 to us, that we also, like they did, have a race to run, and we need to run it patiently. Now, patience in the Bible is not just waiting. Like when we think, when we tell our children to be patient, we're saying, hey, you need to, to wait a, a certain time until something is ready or you get something. Whereas patience in the Bible is actually enduring through tribulation, enduring through hard times and being patient or enduring uh, with that. So that's why when he says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us, it's like, hey, we got to endure through these hard times as believers because God not only, you know, we're not only going to go through tribulation and persecution from the world as believers, but then Hebrews 12 gets into another reason why we face hard times as well. So Hebrews 12, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now what I believe that is talking about is because these Hebrews actually lived at the time of the apostles. So I think he's saying that, you know, just like back then they had apostles and prophets throughout the years witnessing to them. And when he's writing to these Hebrews, he's saying, hey, you, you have the apostles. You're a, you were compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. We are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses in the sense we have the written testimony of these witnesses but i think these people you yeah, actually knew them at the time you know um, that's why it says uh you know uh, uh obey them that have the rule over you so there were i think there were early leaders in the church that these people knew uh, that actually may have actually seen jesus let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us see so if we want to run this race well we need to be willing to cut that sin out of our life that is holding us back. You know, I'm sure all of us, if we're honest with ourselves, have, you know, sins that we struggle with, sins that we're not willing to let go of, whatever that is, you know, laziness. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's, you know, drunkenness, or maybe it's, a, it's like some sort of drug that you're taking. Um, maybe there are other things. You know, it could be laziness, um, you know, what else? You know, maybe it's not submitting to your husband. Maybe it's not ruling your house well. Uh, maybe for kids, it's not listening to your parents. So there is a sin that we are holding on to that we're not willing to let go of. And you need to understand that that sin that you are holding on to, that you don't think is a big deal, is greatly hindering your spiritual walk, your spiritual success. So if you want to run this race with patience and be successful in this spiritual race, you need to be willing to cut some things out of your life. Some things that are vain. See, not just things that are sin. It says, let us lay aside every weight. Sometimes there are things that are not sinful, but there's just too much excess weight in your life. Pleasures, cares of this life, riches in this world, things that you want to do that are holding you back from doing more for the Lord. And you know, if you have a vision of eternity, knowing what heaven is going to be like, knowing that the rewards that will await you in heaven, if you use your life to serve the Lord, you know the pleasures in this life, like, the, like that hymn says, the, the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And you know, you know that, that holiday, you, you'll be, you know, that's why through faith you can do these three things, because through faith you see heaven. Through faith, you see the rewards. Through faith, you see that eternal life, that eternal city that we are looking to. And if you have that faith, 
where you're looking to the things of God, you're looking to the things of eternity, then when you look at the physical things, the physical pleasures in this life, the things that you can own, the things you can experience, those things greatly diminish. And it'll help you to run this, pay, this race that you are exhorted to run. See, we are in a race. So we ought to be striving to win this race. Run that you may win, the Bible tells us. The race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So just like when it talks about Moses, Moses endured seeing Christ, we ought to look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So you see, you know, Christ did not enjoy going through the shame. And the Bible says he hated, he despised the shame that he went through. But why did, was he willing to go through it? Because of love. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now this is one way we can muster up in our spirit the strength to go through hard times. The Bible says, for consider him that endured. See, when you're running this race, Right, and you're trying to do great things for the Lord, or you're just going through hard times, you need to consider Jesus Christ. Because it says here, you know, we're running this race, but we're going to need to look unto Jesus, who went through this suffering. You ought to consider him. Consider what Jesus went through. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Right, what's the contrary? The fact that you know, sinners were doing this stuff, this stuff to him lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. What is that saying? Lest you get tired of going through these hard times and quit. So when you're going through hard times, or you're trying to do something good and you're trying to endure patiently this race that you are running, when you, when you find it hard, you need to look back to Jesus and think, you know, hey, he went through such hard times. So not only, there's two ways to think of it when I think of that. One is what you are going through is so much less than what Jesus went through. So sometimes we get this frame of mind where it's, oh man, I just, you know, I'm just going through such hard times and just all this. You know, the Bible talks about, you know, you have not, you know, we'll read it a bit later. You, you haven't, you know, strive against blood, you know, striving against sin, uh, resisted uh, uh, to blood, striving against sin. Sorry, verse 4. So it says here, ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. So one is our trials compared to Jesus' trials are actually quite small. So that can help us when we think about you know, looking at it in perspective. But not only that is our trials small compared to Jesus' trials, but we have, like the Bible says in Hebrews, we have a high priest you know, who, who is not... You know, he's touched with the feeling of our infirmity, right? He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus understands what you're going through because he resisted against sin as well. So we have somebody that you, when you pray to God, you're not praying to a God that is high and mighty, that does not understand what you're going through. Jesus understands the pain and the struggle you are going through because he went through so much worse. That's what that's saying there. So not only are there trials that we go through in terms of persecution, but what Hebrews 12 is telling us here is also there is a chastening from God. So there is a twofold reason for why you may go through hard times. One is it may just be external forces, persecution coming on you, but it's also God chastening you and trying to mold you and trying to help you to grow and that's why he says here it's, it's not only the hard times you're going through but it's also you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children my son despise not thou the chastening of the lord nor faint when thou art rebuked of him so sometimes god can can uh can chasten you through his own means but sometimes god can use persecution to chasten you as well, right? You go through hard times to mold you, to correct you, to get you to grow. Despise not thou the chasing of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son 
whom he receiveth. Now this is the difference between chastening and cursing, right? Because some people get the wrong idea that when they are, you know, going through hard times, oh, you know, I'm under the curse of God. But see here, see how it says with chasteneth? It says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. See, it's not the, for whom the Lord hateth, he chasteneth, but cursing is who God hates, right? God puts a curse on people because that's, that's out of hatred and anger. But chastening of the Lord is out of love. So you need to understand that as a New Testament believer, that when you go through hard times, and maybe that is of the Lord, that's not always because God is angry with you or God hates you. God loves you. He's displeased with you, but he is correcting you and chastening you out of love, not out of anger and out of hatred. And that is a really big deal, right? Because sometimes when you are in a low point in your spiritual life, Sometimes, you know, I don't know whether it's satanic influence or not, but that's when you start getting that little whisper in your ear, like, God's done with you. Yeah. You know, God, you know, look at, look at you now. You know, God's turned his back on you. Look at what you're doing. But you need to understand that when you go through those hard times, even when you are disgusted with yourself, God may correct you, but he doesn't do that out of anger. He doesn't do that out of hatred. He loves you with an everlasting love. If you're a child of his because you've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are chastened and corrected out of love, not out of hatred. So not only do we learn that, but we learn that you know, if we love our children, our physical children, obviously we are going to chasten them. So guys, you need to be chastening, not just rebuking with words, but actually physically, scourging, right? You actually have to spank your kids. Make sure you're doing it. I know it's not something easy, right? It's not easy to spank your kids. It takes time, you know, you get frustrated with it, but you need to have the right frame of mind. You need to be spanking your kids and you need to be loving them at the same time. Because remember, it's both. If you only do this, you know, you won't raise children that love and respect you. And here too, if you only do this, you're going to raise children that are just spoiled, right? They don't understand what it means to be punished. And if you do it from an early age, you know, try not get into the habit. Don't make excuses for your children, right? Like even now, like I'm starting to spank. We're starting to spank Noah now, you know, just like spanks on the arm, spanks on the bum, because she, she's, she's starting to get naughty, right? But she understands now. Because, I mean, you'll, she, she'll be sitting on the seat and you'll tell her like, hey, Put your legs straight or sit down and then she'll do it. So just because you think she's just like, oh, you know, walking around loud, but she understands when we say no, right? So she's starting to, to understand that. So what I'm saying is, guys, like, don't make excuses for your kids. Like, just because they're young, you know, you say, oh, kids are just playing up, kids are just whining, you know, things like that. You don't want to make excuses for them. You, want, you, need, to, you need to spank that out. That's what I do with my kids. That's why, like, they, they know, like, obviously they still whine, but... I don't let them whine. Right? Like when they whine, that gets them a spanking because I don't want whining in my house. So just consider that, guys. Consider that you, know, you, need to, you need to make sure your kids are getting spanked. I know it's hard sometimes and it's hard to just make excuses and just go, I'll do it later or, or whatnot. But if you don't put it off, if you just deal with it when it happens, you do it properly, you'll be amazed at the results you get. And remember, you have to love them as well. So you can't just spank them. If your kids don't understand that they're loved, they'll just get bitter when they're just getting spanked all the time. God is the same, right? If we didn't know that God loved us, if we're not reminded of God's love, I mean, wouldn't people just get bitter just thinking, why am I always under the chastisement of God? But if they realize, hey, God loves them. God demonstrated that when he died for them on the cross. It makes a big difference. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son? Uh, is he whom the Father chasteneth not? Now, where does this exhortation come from? I don't, I don't need to read this because it's the exact same quote, but if you're wondering where it says, you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, this is actually a proverb, if you didn't know that. So in Proverbs 3, that's where it's being quoted from. So he's saying, hey, you've forgotten about that proverb that says, you know, not only are you going to go through hard times, but also hard times are going to come through the chastening of God. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers. Right? So every child needs to get spanked. And I can testify to that. Every one of my children needs to get spanked. And every one of God's children needs to get spanked. Why? Because we all have sin to a certain extent in our lives. 
If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. So this is where you can see that if it's a legit, illegitimate son, it's a bastard, not a son. This is why Ishmael was not the firstborn son. It was Isaac. Furthermore, uh, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. So I've just underlined this because if you are spanking your children and correcting them and disciplining them and loving them correctly, you will have a child that fears and re reverences you. Right? So you can, you can tell, right? You can tell the difference between people that are disciplining their children correctly and people that are not disciplining their children correctly because when they speak or when they talk to their children, their children take heed. Why? It's because that's how it is at home. So you need to have that sort of authority in your home where if you ask your child to do something, don't ask your child to do it and if they don't do it, it's like, ah, oh, you know, they're just kids, maybe they didn't hear me. Sometimes I will ask my child, you know, what did I say? And if they repeat it, they're in trouble, <laughs> right? Because that means they heard me, they ignored me, and I don't want to have to say it three, four, five times. I want to train my children that when I ask them to do something, they do it straight away. And if you have that high standard and you have that sort of clout or authority in your home, then when you say things, they just do it. That's why when you see me, I just ask my kids to do something. You know, they just do it because that's how it is at home. That's what I try and, and, and have that sort of uh, culture or environment in my home so that when I'm out and about, it's minimized. So if you're only disciplining your children when you're out and about, it's going to be a lot harder. Why? Because they're more excited out and about. And also, you know, you're probably a bit more self-conscious telling them off and disciplining them when you're out and about, when you're at other people's houses or when you're at church or when you're out at the shopping centre or with family. But if you hold a high standard at home, and, you know, because sometimes at home, maybe you're a bit more lenient, right? Because nobody's watching, you know, nobody's there, it's just you and your, your wife. Uh, and you might think, oh, you know, they're just playing up because they're at home. Don't have that attitude because if you allow them that sort of leeway at home, it's going to be even more difficult out and about. So don't, don't have the, the opposite mindset where it's like at home you're lenient and then out and about you try and be strict. It needs to be the opposite. You need to be even more strict at home so that when you're out and about and children are more inclined to play up, that, then it limits how naughty they are when they're out and about and how, how much crazier they get out and about. That's my experience. Okay, let's keep going. Much rather be in subjection unto the Father of Spirits and live, for they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. A few days. So just like with your kids, you only get a short amount of time with them. Right? So make sure you're spending time with them, make sure you're spending time correcting them, make sure you're spending time teaching them. Because before you know it, they're, they're already adults. You know, and once they're adults, you know, the spanking is not, not going to do it anymore. So, you know, make sure that when, when the spanking is effective, which is when they're younger, uh, you are doing it. Chasten after, after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that way we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So just be consistent with your discipline. You don't need to worry if you discipline your children and they don't change immediately or they don't change the next day just make sure they understand that they were disciplined that just constant consistent discipline you'll be amazed at how much changes and have the faith to know that the bible says yes it's grievous in that moment right it's not enjoyable for you or for the child in that moment but have the faith to continue with it because we have the promise here that afterward it will yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And those of us who have gone through it have seen it. All right, so that can give you some confidence in what you're doing. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. I think this is basically saying, therefore, like pick your head up, right, and go. Lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. So a lot of people use this passage to say that, hey, in order to see the Lord, you have to keep the commandments. But no, of course, you know, it's like the Bible says, be perfect, you know, as, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. This is exhorting us to follow peace and holiness, right? 
but it's the imputed righteousness that allows us to be perfect in that and allow us to see the Lord. It's the same when Jesus taught in Matthew, right, through the Beatitudes and things like that. In Matthew 5, 6, and 7, he's teaching us holy living and alluding to that, leading to be able to see the Lord. But ultimately, we can't establish our own righteousness with God's, with, by keeping God's commandments. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. So not only see are we trying to do right, but we are making sure not only ourselves are saved, that we believe on Jesus, but others around us are saved. Lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. So again, just because people aren't saved because they believe, but oftentimes it's sin that is making them not believe, right? It's the deceitfulness of sin sometimes that is getting them away. And this is why people that want to hold on to fornication or profanity like Esau, they oftentimes, you know, don't get saved, right? Because they want to hold on to those things. And sometimes that stops people from getting saved who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So why is Esau being likened to Hebrew Christians? Because the Hebrews were the ones that were first given the prophets, were first given the message of God. So because of that, that was like their birthright. As they were born into the nation of Israel, they first had the first chance and the prophets sent to them. So same with Esau, he had a birthright, but because of these things, he sold it. So I don't know, there is discussion around, you know, whether Esau was saved or not. I'm not 100% sure. You know, I kind of lean to he, he may have been saved, but we're not sure. He, but he is used as an example of unsaved people because what he did is basically he was, he was um, hungry. If you, don't, if you don't remember the story or what it's saying about here, if you remember Esau was hungry and he came back from the field and he was so foolish when Jacob, his brother, was cooking some things and he asked for that food, Jacob said, sell me your birthright, I'll give you the food. And because Esau basically did not value what he was given as the firstborn, he, he made that trade. And he said, well, I'll give it to you and then, you know, get, get him the meat. So I guess he forgot about that, but then later on, God used, you know, Rebecca to trick Isaac to bless, you know, um, Jacob instead of Esau. You remember he was tricked and uh, Rebecca put fur on Jacob's, um, you know, on Jacob, so that when he felt him, and then Isaac ended up blessing that. So it's, it's quite an interesting story in the sense of how God can work things to his will, even though people have free will to do things, because God already in the womb said, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. But yet it was Esau's free will that made him sell, sell his birthright. And then it was Rebecca's free will to trick, right, uh, you know, uh, his, her, her husband into blessing Jacob instead of Esau, um, but, but somehow that, you know, uh, made God's will be accomplished. So sometimes you think, you know, because Rebecca tricked Isaac because she knew when her twins were in the womb, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. So you kind of think, well, if God had never told her that, would she have tricked Isaac and then fulfilled that? Or, you know what I mean? Like, well, how does it work? So, or would it have happened anyway? If she didn't trick you know, Isaac, would, would Jacob have somehow got the blessing another way? Who knows? Only God knows. But it's just an interesting turn of events there, how that happens, that Rebecca was responding to something God had told her and in effect carried it out. So I don't know whether Esau is saved or not, but he is used as an example because when he lost the blessing, he came back to Jacob begging to get that blessing back. But, uh, sorry, Isaac, but Isaac had already given that to Jacob. So that's what this is referring to when it says when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. It's not saying that he was rejected of salvation. He was rejected of that blessing that he got because he was the firstborn, but he sold it to Jacob for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now, his example is being used like salvation because hebrews we learn about people that are so close to salvation and yet they fall away and then they cannot be renewed again unto repentance so his example is being used like salvation which is why people will say well this is why esau was not saved but it's not a guarantee right it's just that's they're saying hey esau's situation is being used as an example of unsaved people now for ye are not come unto the mount so this is where, when we talk about drawing nigh to God in Hebrews 10, 
And we talked about the difference between drawing nigh to God boldly in the spiritual temple through faith in Jesus Christ and the, the priest being fearful of drawing nigh to God because he had to do all these things perfectly right and the sacrifice to enter into the holiest with blood. So this is the other example that was used in Hebrews 10 where the people at the mount, where they can come boldly. So he's saying, hey, because we have Jesus, you're, you're not coming unto the mount, which is Mount Sinai, right? That might be touched and that burned with fire and God descended on that mount, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them anymore. If you remember the story in Mount Sinai, when God descended and spoke the Ten Commandments, the nation of Israel said, you know, no, we're going to die if God keeps talking to us. Moses, you go up and talk to God and you tell us what he's going to say. So that's what he's saying. He's comparing that mountain of fear, not being able to go boldly to that mountain. You couldn't even touch it at some point, right? You can touch, because if you did, you'd be killed or even a beast touch it. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. What's that? An arrow, right? And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. So it was so fearful to approach that Mount Sinai that even Moses, who was called to go up and intercede on the behalf of the children of Israel, said that he was scared to go up. I exceedingly fear and quake. Now what is that being compared to in the New Testament? Well, we can come boldly to. But ye are come unto Mount Zion. So you see how Mount Sinai is the earthly example of Mount Zion, which is the real mountain that God is on, right? Unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels. So that's just describing, obviously, the heavenly Jerusalem. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn. So that's the same as saying church of Jesus Christ, right? Because Jesus Christ is the firstborn. Which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. So he's sort of like summing up all these things that we've learned about in previous Hebrew chapters. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. What does that mean? That the blood of sprinkling speaketh better things than that of Abel. Well, when Abel was killed by his brother, do you remember in Genesis, God says, the blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. So that's what it's referring to, that the blood cries out to God. That's why when so much innocent blood is shed in a nation, God judges that nation, right? Because that blood is crying out to him, the blood of innocent children, the blood of the martyrs, the blood of Abel. And like blood says something to God, the blood of Jesus testifies on our behalf on the mercy seat. And that's why it's saying the blood of Jesus is even better than the blood of Abel that cried out to the Lord for um, intercession. See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. So it's talking about God now. For if they escaped not, uh, if they, for if they escaped not, who refused him that spake on earth. So it's saying they didn't escape, the people that refused him. So who is the him that spake on earth here? I believe that's talking about Moses. Right? Because Moses delivered the law. Now they didn't escape when Moses delivered the law. Much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven. So he's saying here, it's like in, uh, I think it's in Hebrews 10, where it says, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. So that's the same thought here, that if you reject Moses, the law of Moses, how much more should you be scared if you reject God, the one who's speaking from heaven? Whose voice then shook the earth. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't that be so crazy to be, have been there at Mount Sinai to think that God descends on this mountain and just when he speaks, the, the, the ground is actually shaking? That's nuts. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard like really loud music and you just feel like it's just moving your heart, you know, as that music is pumping. You know, if you've ever been in a nightclub or a pub, it's just playing that music so loud, right? Or when people, you know, when people just put those sound systems in their car. You have friends that just put these huge sound systems in their car and you're sitting in the back and they turn it up and it's like moving your body. Just imagine hearing God speak from heaven and it's not just moving the car in your body, it's moving the earth. Uh, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from him, whose voice then shook the earth 
but now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more, so he's saying here that God is saying, Hey, yet once more I'm going to shake the earth only. And then Paul explains this word, yet once more. So when God says yet once more, it means that he's only going to shake it one more time. Right? So it's not going to get shaken again. That's why he's saying once he shakes it, it signifies, it means the removing of those things that are shaken. So when he says, I shake the earth once more, he's saying, hey, one more time, God's going to shake this earth and this earth will pass away. Right? As of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. So a reminder that there are temporary things on this earth. So if it's something that can be shaken, right, the physical things, these things are going to go. So work for the heavenly things. Lay up your treasure in heaven, not on earth. For wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace. So you see how we approach the Mount Zion? We're not approaching by works where we exceedingly fear and quake like Moses. We approach by grace. Right? Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear right this is in the kingdom of heaven right the kingdom of heaven that is with us now where we serve god in the spirit for our god is a consuming fire now we get on to hebrews 13. so hebrews 12 was a reminder hey there are two reasons why you go through hard times just persecution in general from the world but also loving chastisement from god and you can, and can go through this, and it's a reminder that you can come boldly onto God's mountain. It's not like the mountain in Mount, Zion, uh, Mount Sinai. Now Hebrews 13 is when Paul finishes off the chapter, and he basically gives some practical instruction to the Hebrew church here. And that's why you just see here, like some commandments one after another of practical things that we can do. Let brotherly love continue so he wants us to love one another that is that goes without explanation be not forgetful to entertain strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unaware now i just want you to be obviously mindful of this in the sense that what does it mean to entertain strangers that doesn't just mean that you know people you don't know just let them into your house and sleep at your house and put yourself in danger right but I think it's just entertaining them. You know, you might have them over for something to eat because obviously when you're sleeping, it's a bit more dangerous. Or, you know, even like when they come to church, you know, when it's like, hey, make sure that you're, you know, you, you, you welcome people and you're welcoming and loving to them and, and entertain them. So it's entertain. It's not necessarily just let them stay with you. Um, so if you let people stay with you, you want to have some level of confidence that you know who they are. For thereby... Some have entertained angels unawares. This is, isn't this interesting? That there are, you know, people say, oh, are angels walking amongst us? Maybe. You know, because the Bible says that when you entertain people that come either to your church or come through in the area and they're believers, sometimes they were angels. They weren't actually men. But the thing is, you, you didn't know the difference. This is why I don't believe angels you know, necessarily have wings. Uh, I, I think angels are just men but they're just not fleshly men. You know, they're spiritual men that God uses as ministering spirits, as we saw in the beginning. And that's why they're compared to men. You know, the angels and men with Jesus. Some have entertained angels unaware. So sometimes when you are hospitable to somebody, you, you may not even know that that person is an angel. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves. So just as we go through these, just think about these internally to yourself. Like, let brotherly love continue. Think, hey, you know, do I show enough love to my brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, is it all about me? Am I always thinking about how do people love? What are people doing for me? Or is it, you know, am I showing brotherly love to others? This is what you want to think about as you read through passages like this. You want to apply it to yourself. So you read, let brotherly love continue. It's not, nobody's loving to me. Who's loving me? No, it's, hey, I, I ought to be, am I loving enough? Could I be more loving to people? Could I be more loving to my brothers and sisters in Christ? You know, loving is not just a feeling room, it's an action. And we talk about 1 Corinthians 13. This one, you know, are you hospitable enough? You know, you're thinking, well, this person's never invited me over for dinner. Well, how many people have you invited over for dinner? You know, how many people have you had over? Could you invite somebody at church over for dinner and show that brotherly love and build some relationships cross boundaries? right in the church 
You know, we all have our comfortable groups we hang in. But this is where, this is really good if you're hospitable, if you want to break down those barriers, if you're wondering, oh, you know, I don't really know everyone in church. If you have somebody over for dinner, you'll get to know that person. Right? So you have them over, you talk with them, you break down those barriers. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them and them which suffer adversity as being yourselves. So what is this one talking about? How do, you, how do you have some compassion or empathy with people going through hard times? Well, you try and put yourself in their shoes. Right? So when people are going through hard times, you don't just say, ah, oh, you know, get over it kind of thing. You know, well, you have, you have to understand, you need to put them in your shoes. You may be able to say, get over it if you are, have gone through it before. And you know, try and encourage them to say, hey, you know, this is not as, as serious a thing as you think about. But that's why he's saying, suffer firstly, as being yourself. So it's teaching us to try and think like others, put people into, put, put yourselves in other people's shoes. Now, here's an exhortation to not fornicate, right? To not commit fornicate, which is having sex outside of marriage. And obviously that would extend to pornography, right? Because pornography is fornication in your heart. You know, like, like Jesus says, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already with her in your heart. So that's why this is an exhortation that people should have sexual relationships in marriage. Marriage is honourable in all and the bed undefiled. But, so it's being compared to whoremongers and adulterers, right? So these are people that commit fornication. These are people that commit fornication to married people. All right, so marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled. So isn't it interesting that it's being compared? So there's nothing wrong inherently with the actions that these people are doing. It's just that it should be in marriage. You know, sex is a very beautiful thing that God has created. To be able to enjoy one another's bodies but it's honourable in marriage. So, you know, this is where, you know, anything that is done within the marriage bed is allowed because God has built, you know, man and woman to enjoy one another. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. You know, a couple of things on this passage is one way to overcome covetousness is to realize what you have in God. Right? So if you're thinking, oh, I just need this. And what does it mean to be covetous? It's when you, desire, you know, when you get your joy and your fulfillment and you are serving just to get things and riches. So, you know, let me, if you think about covetousness, you know, you, let's think, think about a purchase that you were really excited about, right? Or maybe a holiday you were really excited about. And when you're really excited about what, what is it like, you're thinking about it all the time, aren't you? You know, when, when, when it comes closer, you start to get excited. You know what I mean? Your heart starts racing. Man, when you, when you, got, when you finally got it, man, the joy you experienced when you went through that pleasure or you went through that experience or you got that thing and man it just it just put you on top of the world didn't it and then maybe the plans didn't go through or maybe whatever you got was stolen or broken then how did you feel man you just were shot just couldn't pick yourself up nothing could yeah it's the worst day of your life if you understand that feeling that is covetousness because that's how you ought to be thinking about god like God should be taking that place in your life where He is your thought, He's what you meditate on, He's what you get excited about. He's what would destroy your life if you were without Him. And instead of God being in that position, and He's worthy of that position because of what He has done for you, you have put something else in its place, a thing in its place. Now can you see how, why covetousness is called idolatry in the Bible? Because it's basically putting a thing that is made by man. It's almost as silly as, you know, the person carving out a piece of wood into a man and thinking it has that power. It is likened to that because man has made this thing and you have given it the attention and the passion and the adoration that only God is worthy of. So he's saying, hey, be without covetous, be content with such things. You have God. Now, why does, what does it mean to be content? Content doesn't mean you, you can't desire to have some nice things, right? So it's not wrong necessarily to want something else. 
you know, to enjoy, enjoy some things in this life. It's, it's when it takes the place of God. It's when it's, that's the purpose and the reason you're living. That's when you're covetous, right? And that's all your life is about. But you can have your life about God and still enjoy some nice things, right? It's not wrong to go on a holiday. It's not wrong to buy yourself something. What does it mean to be content, though? First Timothy 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world, and is certain we can carry nothing out. Having food and raiment, let us be there with content. So what it means to be content is that you are happy with the things that you have. Now how do you test whether you're happy with the things that you have? It's when you lose it, right? Because that's why it's reminding you when you leave this world, it's all going to be gone. Are you still happy? Are you still content? Or when you lose that thing, does it just remove all the joy that you had? You're like, you know, you get that thing, you're like, oh, I'm happy, and oh, it's not, this is not that thing that's making me happy, I'm just happy in the Lord, right? And then when it gets taken away, you lose your happiness. Well, that just proved to you that it wasn't just happiness in the Lord, that was proving to you that you got your happiness from something else, your joy. But they that will be rich, what is that? They that desire, that's their reason for living. They want to just amass riches for into temptation and a snare. So see, it's not wrong to be rich, but it's wrong that that's the reason why you're living, right? And into many foolish and hurtful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition for the love of money. See, it's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Which while some coveted after they've erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows, but thou, O man of God, flee these things. You want to get away from covetousness and follow after righteousness, godliness, Faith, love, patience, meekness. Let's continue. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now this is a very strong argument for eternal security. Right? Number one is it's saying God will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, you may forsake God, but God will never forsake you. That's why you can't get away from God because God's not going to forsake you even if you forsake Him. Now, why would this be spoken of in the context of covetousness if you could lose salvation? Think about it, right? Because he's teaching here that you can, you can overcome covetousness, which is material wealth and possession, seeking that because you always have God. But if you could lose your salvation, if you could not always have God, how is that satisfying covetousness, right? So... That's why I think it ties in with covetousness. The fact that you know you have this, you always have this. You don't need to desire necessary material wealth. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my help. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. This is to say, hey, people who are leaders in the faith that you look to, you ought to take them as an example and follow their example. And these are generally the people that are teaching you the Bible. So in this church, it should be me, as well as others that are out there that are teaching the Bible, that you're learning from. You take them as an example. The word of it, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. So number one, conversation doesn't mean just what they're saying, right? It's their lifestyle. So you're looking at the way they live. You ought to take some cues and some example from the way we live. Right, so it's not just always, oh, Victor hasn't taught on that, so I don't know what to do. If you see us do it, if you see how we live our life, that's what we believe. Because we believe that, we think that's the best, that's why we do it. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. This is not saying consider necessarily like, you know, where they're going to be when they die, but also the purpose, right? So it's not only the end, but to this end I was born, Jesus says. So it's this purpose. So it's a purpose, but also the purpose is, is where, where we go when we die. So considering the purpose of why they live that way. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's very important that you understand this verse as this is talking about Jesus Christ in his deity. It's Jesus Christ in his deity is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you don't understand that Jesus Christ has both a divine and a human nature, You'll get mixed up with passages like this because in his humanity, he did change, right? He had to be perfect through suffering. He grew in wisdom and in stature. He did not know all things, right? Obviously, he changed because he went from a baby to a man. So that's why when people say, well, I, you know, somebody might scoff at the Bible saying, well, Jesus Christ did change. Well, they're not understanding that that's that mystery of God manifest in the flesh. He had flesh, which allowed him to do these things. 
but he was still God and in his deity he never changes. The same yesterday, today and forever. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. So the immediate context of here is people telling the Hebrews the diverse and strange doctrines is what to eat, what not to eat, and all these sorts of things, right? That's why he's saying, hey, it's about grace. It's not about the dead works. It's not about the eating laws and things like that. But here in the New Testament, how do we determine diverse and strange doctrines? It's things that deviate from the Bible. That's why ultimately everything we believe is based on the Bible. And when things deviate from the Bible, that's what's diverse and strange doctrine. Diverse and strange doctrines is not just something that you haven't heard before and you haven't studied out. You know, this is where people think, oh, you know, it's a diverse and strange doctrine, but it's just because they've never studied it. They've never thought about it. They're like, oh, that sounds weird. I've never heard that before. Well, it's not a strange doctrine because you don't know about it. It's a diverse and strange doctrine because it isn't what the Bible actually teaches. So this is where he says, which have not profited them, which have been occupied there. And then he compares it here. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. So you see, there were some sacrifices where they would offer to God and then in the tabernacle, they would eat it together. You know, they would eat. That's why the Bible says when you bring your tithe, right? Your tithe was an offering you're giving to God that belonged to God in the Old Testament. You bring, but when you go there to offer, you actually go there and eat. That's why the Bible says if, you, if the way is too far and you, you can't bring your tithe with you to, to sacrifice it, enjoy it at the temple, you would sell it for money. And then when you get there, you'd buy it for things that you desire right for you know oxen and uh, whatever and all sorts of wine and corn and oil so you get there you buy it because then you would come and you'd offer it to god and it would be like a feast there with with the priests and whatnot they'd be eating of that too but but there are sacrifices for for sin some sacrifices for sin where they would sacrifice the animal especially the ones to get into the holiest of all and sprinkle the blood but they would not eat of that animal. They would take that animal without the camp and then burn it. So this is talking about that offering in the Old Testament where there are some sacrifices which were not to be eaten. So why is he talking about that in Hebrews 13? Because there were diverse and strange doctrines of people saying, hey, eat this, don't eat that, can you eat this, can you eat that, can you what not? And he's making the point of, it's, guys, it's not about what you eat. And in fact, one of the pictures of Jesus Christ is that there were sacrifices which were not eaten, right? And that's the sacrifice for sin, that Jesus Christ is being shrinked on the mercy seat. So it's not about eating, right? Because there's nothing to eat here. Um, let's go back. We have an altar. That's why he says, we have an altar. So let's talk about this spiritual. Whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. Talking about Jesus Christ. And then he compares it to the Old Testament for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned without the camp. He then continues with this analogy where he says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. So this is him being taken out of the city to the cross, suffering, you know, being obedient unto death, even the death of the cross, and despising that shame, right, which is talked about further up in Hebrews 12. So he suffered without the gate. So not only is it, there's, there's no eating to be done because there's no body, to, you know, the body was burned without the camp. He goes on with that analogy that Jesus suffered without the gate. And that for us spiritually now in the New Testament is us. Let us go therefore, forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. So it's an exhortation for you, like I said, to run with patience, that race with Jesus and it's going to put some shame on you. So be willing to go through that shame. Sometimes it's from family. Sometimes family will shame you, like, hey, you're not holding on to our traditions. You're not doing this and that that we taught you, but you're doing what's right. That is how you suffer without the camp, bearing the reproach of Jesus Christ. You are suffering with him. So have that boldness. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. For here have we... No continuing city, right? Because this is not our home. We seek one to come. So be reminded, even if you go through hard times in this life, this life and this world is temporary. So it's worth it. Go through it. 
By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks unto his name. So not only in song, but just giving thanks to God is an offering that you can give to him. And this is why it says here, um, uh, yeah, basically, like, yeah, saying things to God is one way we can say. So you can see here through Hebrews 13, the analogies continue, don't they? The analogies continue of how it is likened to the Old Testament tabernacle, that even the things we say and the songs that we sing is giving an offering to God. But to do good, so not only what we say, but the things that we give of our resources, but to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. So it is a command in the Bible to obviously use our resources, because even though we use our time to serve God, we use our resources as well, whether that's giving money or whether that's contributing or donating things. But to do good and to communicate, forget not. So this is not just saying the fruit of your lips is what you're communicating. Right? To communicate in the Bible means to actually give of your resources. And we'll see this here in a few verses. First Timothy 6, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. And really, that's us. If you think about, who, you, you may say, well, I'm not rich. But you are rich compared to the rich the people in this world, right? We probably are in the top you know, 1% uh, of the world. Maybe not the top 1% of a Western society. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, look at this, willing to communicate. Right? So people that have resources, you don't, ought not to be holding on to those too tightly. You ought to be using those for the kingdom of God. Philippians 4, look at this, notwithstanding, ye have well done that ye did communicate with my affliction. Well, how did they communicate? Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. See, it's not just about... See, when you give even to the church or to a ministry... It's not about the money because they're not, I mean, you know, even when you give to this church, that money is not just going into my pocket, right? This money is like going to pay for expenses. It's going to pay for rent. You know, it's just paying for basic necessities. So it's like, you know, when you look around the building, I mean, if you give to this church and you give consistently, you know, you want to you know, take some pleasure in, you know, looking the fact that we have this building, the fact that we have, ch you know, chairs that are part of this building, all this equipment, the camera, the, 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 this pulpit, my laptop, all this. This could not be done without you guys contributing. So that, you know, you ought to take some pleasure in that and say, hey, you know, you contributed to, to bringing this together. So it's not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So one way and a better way to contribute to the work of God is you actually get in and labor in the highways and hedges. But when you contribute financially to the work of God, you also partake in that work. So when people give to our ministry, they partner with us and labor in the work that we do here. But I have all and abound and am full, having received of Paphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell. Look at this. A sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So you see there how the things we say and the praise we give to God and the resources and money we give to God's work is likened to those animal sacrifices and offerings that are done in the Old Testament. Verse 17, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. So this is about obeying those that are in authority in the church. In this church, it's me, right? So this is why it's, you know, for you, it's for your own benefit to submit under the teaching and to the leadership that I provide here. If you don't, it won't be profitable for you. And you all, I always do it for your benefit. Look how it says here. Um, for they watch for your souls. So when I'm preaching up here and I'm giving you advice, I'm doing it because I care about you guys. Sometimes people hear my preaching and they're just like, oh, Victor just wants to be hard on me. No, no, the reason why, you, you, think, you think I would rather, I mean, think about it, guys. Like, wouldn't I just rather be your friend? I'd rather just be the nice guy. 
not have to say the mean things, not have to say the things that make you feel uncomfortable. Nobody wants to do that. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. But unfortunately, like in a family and in church, somebody has to be the bad guy and bring things to your attention. So if you, if you take it the wrong way, it's just not going to be good for you. It's not going to be profitable for you. Not only that, if you do it with the wrong attitude. So he says here, you obey and submit yourselves with them that rule over you. But it says here, what's one reason why you want to do it? As they that must give an account, that's me, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. See, so it's more profitable for you to do things that are asked of you in this church because if you do it with joy and not with grief, it's actually better for you. Why? Because it helps me out, right? Because it doesn't, it's not as grievous to me as well as not with, as grievous to you. For that is unprofitable for you. See, if you have a leader that is not doing it with joy, is constantly being, you know, is down about it, it's, they're not going to be as fruitful to you as a leader that is doing it joyfully. So obviously that doesn't remove any responsibility from me to have the right attitude about things, but you can contribute as well to you know, how I lead this church. And not only with how you listen to the things I ask of you, but not only that, if you pray for me, right? if you pray for those that are in leadership, that's why Paul says pray for us. For we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing to live honestly. You know, we're trying to do what's right. But he says, but I beseech you the rather to do this, to do what? To pray for me that I may be restored to you the sooner. So now this is personally with Paul that he wants to see these Hebrew Christians. And he's saying, hey, if you pray for him, he is actually going to come to them sooner. Now we finish off Hebrews. Now the God of peace. This is a blessing that Paul gives to them that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, just mentioning some truths in there at the same time. That great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So you see here, it's, it's pointing them back to Jesus and now reminding them, right, of the blood of the New Testament. That's what's going to make you perfect in every good work, to do his will, right? Perfect according to the conscience. Working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And I beseech you, brethren, I always find this, this verse funny. I beseech you, brethren, Suffer the word of exhortation, for I have written a letter unto you in few words. So even though Paul writes, you know, 13 chapters, it's quite a long chapter as we've been going through it, I would say the same thing to you guys. Suffer the word of exhortation, because it's, it's a good thing for you, for you guys to learn these things. For I have written a letter unto you in few words, even though it's quite a long epistle, one of the, long, one of the, one of the longer epistles, actually. Know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, with whom if he come shortly, I will see you. So you see how Tim Timothy was you know, in jail as well. So this is where we believe it's Paul writing these, uh, you know, because Timothy obviously traveled with Paul. I will see you. Salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints. They of Italy salute you. So that's where he is. Grace be with you all. Amen. All right, I hope that series was a blessing to you guys. You guys learned a lot about Hebrews. And I hope that as you read over it again in your own time, you know, now it'll make a lot more sense to you. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the word of exhortation. And um, Lord, even though in our flesh it may seem long, but in the spirit, you know, I, I wish sometimes you had revealed more to us so we had even more knowledge about you and about the things of God. Sometimes I feel that there are certain topics that are not touched on enough, and we, I, I, I wish we could get more clarification. So, Lord, help us to reflect on that as we, you know, sometimes dis, you know, despise to a point how much Bible there is. And, Lord, there are people that would, you know, would, would um, be willing to die to, to, you know, to get what we have today. Help us not to take that for granted. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you that he is the perfect sacrifice for us. We can come to your mountain boldly. Help us through faith, Lord, to take heed to the instructions given to us in your word. And uh, we need your grace, Lord. We are imperfect, but I pray that your love would constrain us to do more and greater things for you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen.